Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director for the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And I'm a vascular surgeon. And I'm joined here in the studio with a special guest, but he's going to be introduced by Dr. Palma Shaw. Palma is the president-elect of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, and she's currently the secretary. And so Palma basically is joining us from upstate New York. Palma, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Alan. It's great to be with you today. And I'm so thrilled to have Matt and I'd love to introduce him and tell everyone of his remarkable achievements and exactly why we wanted him to here today so we could learn about his life and have, we have a lot of young trainees that watch the show and they're gonna learn from him today. Dr. Thompson is the president and chief executive officer of Endologics. Prior to his CEO appointment in November of 2021, he serves as, as the company's chief medical officer from 2016 overseeing business development, medical affairs, regulatory, clinical, and R&D departments. Among the notable contributions as CMO, he led to the acquisition and integration of the PQ bypass in April of 2021. Previously, he was a professor of surgery in vascular surgery at St. George's University of London and staff surgeon in the Department of Vascular Surgery at the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. Dr. Thompson trained at Cambridge, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, the University of Leicester, and Adelaide. He studied corporate innovation at Stanford University, Graduate School of Business. His awards include a Hunterian Professorship, the Moynihan Traveling Fellowship, and the Gold Medal for the Intercollegiate Examination. His name lectures include the Kinmouth Lecture and the uh, British and uh, the uh, Vascular Surgery of Great Britain Lecture, the British Journal of Surgery Lecture, and the Chi Saw Memorial Lecture uh, from the British Society of Endovascular Therapy. He has published over 400 peer-reviewed journals. His clinical interests are in the treatment of aortic disease and endovascular surgery. His research interests include health service outcome research, clinical trials, and translational investigations into aortic disease. Dr. Thompson is the editor of the Oxford, Oxford Textbook of Vascular Surgery and the Oxford Handbook of Vascular Surgery. He's been the clinical director for three London-wide service reconfigurations in cardiovascular disease, major trauma, and emergency services. He was chair of the National Specialized Commissioning Clinical Reference Group for Vascular Services and the founder of the British Society for Endovascular Therapy, a past council member of the Vascular Society, was chairman of the Vascular Society Annual Scientific Meeting and awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Vascular Society of Great Britain in Ireland in 2017. I'd like to start off with a question really asking Matt, how did you ultimately become interested in medicine and finally vascular surgery? Hi, Palmer. All right. So before Matt, we, before. we got to introduce Palmer to the Queen's English, like, like what it should be spoke, you know? Okay, Palmer. So when people tell me they come from Edinburgh, I go crazy and say it's Edinburgh. So Leicester is Leicester, is the way we say it in Britain. So let, let's practice that. Leicester. <clears throat> Lester. Very good. There, now, go. there we go, Matt. Now we got, now we got the <laughs> housekeeping notes taken care Very of. Very good. Where yeah. my mentor came from. So, Palmer, good question. Medical. How did I get into med medicine? How did I get into medical school? And actually, it's a, it's a kind of silly answer. So I think the first conscious thought I ever had of becoming a doctor was when I was, I don't know, probably 11 or 12, watching MASH. Remember that program? Yep. Mobile Army Surgical Hospital about those guys in the Korean War. And I remember watching it. Alan Alder's character mm. was the surgeon Hawkeye. And I thought, that's a cool guy. That's probably something I'd like to do. And actually, since then, um, kind of worked towards doing my A-levels, which are the sort of higher level examinations in the UK. We specialized very early. I did chemistry, biology, physics. And after that, there's pretty much only one place you go. And I went to medical school. Wow. So the interesting story, though, is I gave that answer in my medical school interview when they said, why do you want to be a doctor? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, I'm kind of interested in being like Hawkeye and MASH. And they went, so, that's the first time we've had a non-scripted answer today. Right. That was you in. That so there me. is a little Houston anecdote yeah. around MASH. <clears throat> you know that Dr. DeBakey is credited with coming up with the concept of the Mobile Article, uh, Army Surgical <laughs> Hospital. I However, did not know we that. also claim the carotid endarterectomy is the first, which you may dispute. <clears throat> possibly, possibly my colleagues <laughs> at St. Mary's might dispute that. All right. Yeah, so MASH. 
So Mash, yeah, actually, it, it, there's quite a bit in the CV really about the development. Uh, he was part of the armed forces for a long time in terms of, uh, the, and was very interested in uh, military vascular trauma. Yeah. Okay, so what happened after that? <coughs> so I went to um, Cambridge um, to do preclinical and then went to St. Bartholomew's Medical School, which is a um, historic old medical school in London. Um, to do clinical practice, uh, went um, to be the attending sort of house officer at the professorial unit there who was run by a guy called Richard Wood, mm -hmm. who you might remember, Alan, mm -hmm. was a guy, a fellow Scotsman, mm -hmm. um, transplant surgeon, vascular surgeon in St. Bartholomew's. And I always thought that my career would just progress down the London rotations, but um, he said to me, um, so you're done in London, you need a proper mentor if you want to be a surgeon, mm. uh, you're off to Leicester. Is that right? And uh, got me a job uh, after interview with, you know, my clinical mentor who was Peter Bell, now Sir Peter Bell, mm -hmm. um, who you know, he was the inaugural professor of surgery in a new medical school, uh, Leicester. He was, again, trained in Sheffield, trained in Glasgow. He was a you know, true general surgeon in the sense of the word, did liver surgery, esophageal surgery, but eventually in the latter stages of his career, he specialized in vascular surgery and transplantation, and he built Leicester into one of the foremost powerhouses of vascular surgical training in the UK. He must have been responsible for 12 to 15 professors of surgery across the UK, had the most amazing career, and towards the end of his career was knighted, so Sir Peter Bell. So you left, like I did, before you got a knighthood out of this, huh? <laughs> Guess we've got to, got to deal with that. Well before. Well before. <laughs> well, well before. All right, so <clears throat> vascular surgery. I mean, I, I first met you, I think, at the Charing Cross meeting. Yeah. Um, now you got interested in vascular surgery, and then you got interested in aorta. I mean, that kind of... Yeah, you know, and it, you know, kind of an intimidating character. When I, I may back up a little bit, there are, there are certain things that are done really well in the United States. There are certain things that are done really well in the UK. I mean, we'd probably argue some of the things are better done in the UK. And I always think that a lot of the good science and the studies are pretty objectively constructed there. And so, you got involved in the vascular surgery world. Yeah. How? So that was a, you know, I was a dyed-in-the-wool orthopedic surgeon when I went off to Leicester. You kind of um, look like an orthopedic yeah, surgeon. Yeah, was a, <laughs> sort of a bit of a jock, played a bit of small <laughs> orthopedic surgery. And then, you know, as I, you know, as I think many people do, you get inspired by a particular person, you get inspired by someone who takes an interest in you. And Peter Bell was the most extraordinary man in terms of, how he developed people's careers, how he mentored people in both surgery but in academia as well. And I think that's really where my interest, that's definitely where my interest in vascular surgery and academic mm -hmm. vascular surgery came into. So it's very much the inspiration of you know one particular person who had formulated this unit that became you know, a trial powerhouse, an academic powerhouse, and was, you know, renowned for being one of the leading vascular surgery units in, in the country. And it was really all down to one guy who, who mm. did that. Palmer? So eventually vascular had evolved into endovascular surgery and you really had a leadership role in that yeah. venue. Can you comment how you <laughs> dove into that? I can. I mean, um, so well before um, it became standard practice, um, Peter Bell was very certain that endovascular was going to play a very significant role in vascular surgery going forward. So all of his trainees rotated through interventional radiology, which at that time um, was where most of the interventions uh, went on. And in Leicester, um, there was a radiologist called Aman Bolia, yeah. um, who worked with another radiologist called Guy Fishwick, and be, you know between them um, they pioneered subintimal angioplasty. So I did a reasonable amount of interventional radiology training in the vascular world um, when I was a fellow, 
And then actually, um, probably the pivotal light bulb moment for me came in the US. So um, Rob Sayers and I, um, Rob's a great friend of mine who's now professor of surgery in Leicester, um, traveled over to the Society of Vascular Surgery meeting, which I think was 1991, 1992 in Chicago. And being over from the UK, we're jet lagged. So we get up, we go to a 6 a.m. breakfast session. Where Only in America. <laughs> would, you, would you have 6 a.m. breakfast sessions in Britain? Absolutely not. <laughs> be deemed very uncivilized. Nor rounds at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> or anything else. Um, but we went to this 6 a.m. breakfast session where, just by extraordinary coincidence, Juan Parodi is presenting mm. the first end of ascular aneurysm repair that he did in Buenos Aires in Argentina with a Palmaz stent, a Dacron tube sewn on the bottom of it and nothing at the bottom at all. Um, but then he presented two other cases that he'd done and you know, Rob and I sat there, were just blown away by this. Uh, went back to Leicester and kind of barged into Peter Bell's office and went, you'll never guess what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Drawings and he said, well, you know, that looks like the future, go for it. So we wrote a grant, we got a grant from the British Heart Foundation to do some experimental work. We ended up, you know, like a lot of people did at that time, um, making homemade surgeon modified component mm. graphs on a back table with giant Palmaz stents with PTFE graphs that we expanded using an esophageal achalasia balloon and <laughs> packaging them into a 27 French sheath. Um, and started a clinical program of endovascular aneurysm repair, really before the first of the commercial endographs were widely available. So that was really my, my start in aortic endovascular surgery, and that really is an interest that you know, persisted throughout my clinical career and obviously in my current job persists today. So were you involved in the ANCURE trial and the ANURX trial and yeah. things like that. So yeah, that's kind of, we started when I was at Emory with ANCURE. I still describe this as the most complicated endovascular device ever invented, being implanted with the least experienced people using the worst imaging. I used to lay awake and I wondered how on earth are we going to get through this? And so it was kind of an adventure, you know, in those days. But the reality was, had that not happened, we would not, as a group of vascular surgeons, been forced into the endovascular world. Mm. We would have given it all away. Yeah. But this was the predicate operation that the majority of us, when endovascular surgery was doing aneurysm repair, was about to be gone. Correct. So I think that was, and that for me was the far-sightedness of Lester Peter Bell, who even from a sketchy drawing that we copied from Parodi's description <laughs> went, we need to be in that because if we're not in that, that goes away. Um, aneurysms at that time were probably the most prevalent vascular operation done in the UK. And really, re we really worked with our own graft for probably five or six years um, before the commercial grafts became widely available that they then supplanted these homemade grafts. Um, but you know, the progress is extraordinary when you think about the initial endovascular grafts we were all doing were 27 French mm -hmm. sheaths and we're now down to 12 to 14 over mm -hmm. that series of years. The progress is extraordinary, but it was that early pioneering spirit, I think, that drove it, drove it forward. Palmer? Well, what about in 2023? A young innovator, a young vascular surgeon comes to you and says, I'm just finishing my training, I'm interested in innovation, I like tinkering with things. How do I get started? How do I build a team? Or how do I find mentors to do this in this era? Yeah, and I, I think probably slightly more difficult, although I think people are still extraordinarily generous um, with their time, both within the medical device industry, but particularly innovative surgeons who you know, have brought disruptive therapies to market. I, the advice I always give is you know, continue to be curious. Um, challenge the dogma. Um, I remember the first pronouncements of some of the established vascular mm. surgeons when it was postulated you might want to do this 
beautiful open operation of aneurysm repair endovascularly. A lot of skepticism, a lot of challenging. So be curious, challenge dogma, but definitely search for a mentor. I think, you know, the, the, these days are not the early 1990s. The requirements of IRBs, of the regulators, are so much more stringent today than they were in those days. And having a mentor who understands the process, um, the complexities of delivering, designing, patenting medical devices, finding a commercial partner, finding a manufacturer, um, that can really only be done by very experienced people. And so I think anyone who's young, who wants to get into that field and wants to become an inventor or even be in medical technology later on in their career um, needs a mentor to do that. And I think you can still find them within you know, innovative surgeons, surgeon inventors, surgeon manufacturers, and there are plenty of people in the medical device industry who, who are willing to give help, but be curious, find a mentor. Uh, and the other thing I'd say is understand the process. Um, until I really got into the industry, I, I don't think I had <clears throat> true appreciation of how complex it is to design a product, get it into clinical trials, get it approved, commercialize it, manufacture it. Um, I, I, I kind of look back with some degree of horror at what I used to say in some of the medical advisory boards that I sat on. Yeah. Where you'd take a graft and go, no, this is terrible. Um, you need to make that smaller, make that bigger, cut a hole in it, package it can we have it next week? And I wish someone had said to me at the time, well, no, that takes five years and $30 million, so you can't do that. So understanding, I think, the, the intricacies and the complexities of, of the device and the inventing business, I think, is, is important. So you, you kind of talked about uh, the influence Peter Bell had. I mean, one of the people who had huge influence, I'm going to really get the credit you should be, is um, Ted Dietrich. Oh, without a doubt. And so, for those of you who don't know, Ted Dietrich was the founder of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists. He also started the Journal of Endovascular Therapy, and he did that out of the Arizona Heart Institute. Do you know where Ted was before he went to the Arizona Heart Institute? Somebody somewhere beginning with H. Um, yeah, Houston I mean, yeah, Methodist Hospital. Yeah. So it's, it's really one of the things I used to talk to him. So, so Ted came here to work with Dr. DeBakey. Um, and this, what's amazing is this was a world of big open surgery here. This was not considered a minimally invasive world. And so how Ted went from working in this environment to becoming the <coughs> center of the endovascular evolution is truly more remarkable. And it's interesting, if you look at some of the first descriptions of uh, translumbar aortography. It came out of here. And so Ted would say that they'd go up to an interventional suite, they'd stick needles, this was Stanley Crawford, in the back until they hit blood. Then they had the sausage roll of flat plate chest x rays, and they go, <laughs> shoot, somebody would be shooting. And he said, it was obvious to me that this was the way into blood vessels, and there's kind of potential for that. But he was never going to be able to develop that here in that era. And so he left and went up and really started it. And so the, the vision of people like that is truly remarkable. When I heard about Paul yeah. stent, I think it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard in my life. Put a piece of chicken wire inside a blood vessel, never going to work. So by and large, I've learned that if I think it's a terrible idea, you should probably invest in it because I've been wrong more often than, I, than, than I've been right. But, but these are the people who built this platform that kind of has created this entire environment. Well, if you think also of you know the contribution that Ted made to education, training, and disseminating endovascular technology, I mean it, it's second to none. I mean I remember when, on an annual basis yep. for ten years, we all descended on Phoenix, the Phoenician Phoenix. Resort, to go to that meeting, which was the meeting that taught you how to do procedures, where you got the kit from, how to source things, and Ted was light years ahead, I think, uh, at that stage. And so we're sitting in the studio, we call it the Debakey Education Studio. Honestly, that meeting shaped what we've built here. Yeah. Because no he was really the first one 
who was really showing live cases. He understood the power of video. You know, I would say a picture paints a thousand words, a video paints a thousand pictures. And being able to, the idea that you would teach surgery from a textbook, you know, with static, it doesn't make any sense. And yeah. so Ted, you know, he had his own uh, medical production group, the video production group. Uh, he had his own animators. Uh, and did that so far ahead of what anybody else was doing. So not only was he evolving these procedures, he was also a pioneer in medical education. Yeah, without doubt. I mean, I think his contribution can't be understated. And of course, you know, I sit here as uh, CEO of Endologics, mm -hmm. which of course is a company that Ted had an integral part yeah. in founding. You know, I you know? completely forgot about that, yeah. actually. Completely forgot about that. Yeah, and he's yeah. interwoven into the, yeah. the history of, you know, all medical devices, but our company in, yeah. in, in particular. But that Phoenician meeting was, you know, the most extraordinary time where everybody and people Thousands were learning people. together. Yeah. Yeah. And Thousands learning together how to do these innovative procedures that were rarely done. Yeah. Tama? So it sounds like, Matt, you've spent quite a bit of time in the States, but how is this transition across the pond <laughs> to living in, this, in the U.S. where we have this strange accent, you know? Yeah, so I live Palmer in, you know, California, which is a little bit different to um, the north and south of London that, that I lived in. But the transition's been good. Um, my wife and I came in in 2016. Um, it's certainly an interesting place to live, California, with uh, recent hurricanes and uh, the fires and the mudslides and the snakes and the sharks. But apart from that, it is, it is paradise. Um, no, I really like living here. California is very diverse. I feel very, very comfortable there. We're, we're very settled. We live in a little beach town um, called Huntington Beach. Uh, and of course, at the same time, um, that for me was a transition from essentially academic clinical practice into uh, a full-time medical device industry role. Um, and that transition itself was, you know, a little bit more difficult. I often liken it to those days when we were residents and you started in a new hospital like one of these large towers behind you and you wandered around for days not really quite knowing where you were, where you were supposed to be, and how to navigate your way through. Um, but some of the aspects, I think, are, are, are interesting. You know, if I was to describe to my former self that you're going to be medical device executive, um, I'd have thought there was no similarities at all between um, surgical practice, academic practice, and, you know, what I do for a living now. And I, and I think that's not not true. Um, you know, I think anyone who comes from clinical practice brings often 20 years of experience of treating patients, of the pathology, the anatomy, the physiology, the, the devices, but also some of the academic rigor um, that is um, really part and parcel of all medical device, medical technology firms. The ability to formulate clinical trials. Alan spoke a little bit earlier on about the British tradition of randomized trials, you know, very important how to analyze data, how to uh, incorporate big data, how to present data in an accessible format to physicians, regulators. There, there are a degree of similarities with some of the disciplines that go in to make a medical device company um, to what we bring in surgery. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, and again, I go back to, to Peter Bell. Um, he always said, be on an even keel when you're a surgeon. Don't celebrate your successes too much. Don't beat yourself up too badly if you have an outcome that's less desirable. Try and keep on an even keel. Try and not be too volatile. And that's pretty good practice for medical technology companies, actually. It's pretty volatile. You can have great days with an FDA approval. You can have bad days when you've got a supply chain disruption or your product's not working as expected. So um, keeping on that even keel and keeping a relatively calm temperament is uh, a good lesson, I think, from, uh, from surgery. So how did you get the business part of this? I mean, had you had anything to do with you know, P&Ls and things like that? You know, in advance, you have an MBA, or are you going to have it's got an MBA? <laughs> So, you know, this is the mea culpa bit. Okay. Right? So, I mean, I, I made the transition. A lot of that 
um, was again, and we spoke about it earlier, was due to mentors. I was very lucky to um, have two great CEOs at Endologics, John McDermott and John Onuchenko, but actually um, I'd been doing a lot of work and I had a lot of conversations with a guy called uh, Bob Mitchell mm -hmm. um, from about 2012 onwards. He and I knew each other in the t 2000s, lost contact, and then uh, made contact again in 2010. And Bob is a consumer medical device, um, sort of experienced executive, but he's an entrepreneur, he's an innovator. He's given advice and helped a numerable number of physician inventors and people who want to transition into industry. And, you know, he and I had been speaking for a long period of time. I'd expressed an interest as making that transition at some stage. So he gave me a lot of advice as to how to approach that. But I think I was remiss, and if I was to do it again, I'd um, do some formal business education a little bit sooner than I did. Um, the story that I have is I came over to Endologics in 2016. Um, John McDermott, the then CEO, uh, was very, very good at putting me at a place in the organization where I think my skill set offered some value, but also allowed me to learn the business. So a lot of that was data analysis, looking at the safety profile of the devices, um, input in designing clinical trials, speaking to regulators about clinical outcomes. And that gave me the, the background of the meeting, but then also allowed me to learn other aspects of the business. But I got a little bit too busy uh, with that and actually deferred my formal business mm. education. And I think in retrospect, I'd have done that earlier. I mean, I ended up doing a year at Stanford um, online predominantly getting a certificate in corporate innovation. I did a couple of Harvard business courses on finances. Mm -hmm. I had the basic understanding of what a PNL looked like from my days as being sort of, you know, cardi running the cardiovascular department at George's, but not to the extent that I understand it now. And the ability to read an income statement and a balance sheet was probably something that passed me by for the first couple of years. But I, I think a formal business um, education is, is going to be absolutely indispensable for anyone who makes that transition. And, you know, Palmer, you said, what advice would you give to someone who wants to make this sort of transition or become interested in that? And I think, you know, if they wanted to do any form of formal business education, I think that is a really good place to start. Tough place to start, but a good place to start. Excellent. Palma? No, I agree. I think the uh, MBA I did was one of the best things I've ever done. I, yeah. I loved every aspect of it, and I found that it helped me a lot in so many ways and how to relate with industry, just talk to industry and, and see their side of things, just like you had said. You just like, fix this device and just make it smaller. Like, it's just so easy to do, but it's just such a much bigger thing for, for the industry leadership. And they appreciate so much when you just give them a little bit of insight that you understand and you can be on the same page with them. So back to being a CMO, um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about a device challenge that you encountered, maybe something that was early on that you navigated and, and how you sort of figured out how to get through it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it was always, you revert back to your, your discipline of, of academic surgery and the data really speaks to how you approach these problems. I mean, our, our particular problem um, that I probably jumped into most when I started in 2016 was Endologics launched a product called AFX Strata in 2011. That was thought to have a type three endoleak problem. The company had made changes since that time to the design of the graft, to the manufacture of the graft, and actually to the labeling of the graft. Um, so the fix had been already made, theoretically. That other product was launched in 2016. So the challenge as a chief medical officer becomes, has that fix worked? So medical devices are very complex. Uh, the human body is even more complex and you're subjecting your endograph to whatever it is, 35 million heartbeats a year. And the question is, can a graph that has been designed differently, manufactured differently and labeled differently perform better than its predecessor? And that's really the challenge, I think, for a lot of 
the aortic section of our medical technology business in that the failure modes are often late and as we get more and more data we see that more failure modes become apparent between five and ten years so I think the challenge for CMOs and safety officers throughout is how do you design a portfolio of evidence that will assure you in the shortest time possible that your graft is working satisfactorily. And I don't think you can do that by dogma or impression or individual cases or anecdotes. You've got to do that with hard evidence. And so um, my challenge was how do you assemble a portfolio of evidence that is good enough to answer that question as is this graft working as well as we think it should be, is it working as well or better than anything else on the market. So um, that was really the challenge and we put together a portfolio of evidence. There was a randomized controlled trial, the Leopard trial, that actually had started before uh, I became um, Chief Medical Officer. but we dove into the VQI, um, who were very useful in providing evidence on comparative outlook data. Um, we worked a little bit with Phil Goodney and his VQI vision group that linked up VQI with Medicare. Uh, we did some multi-center um, studies and we actually have an internal reporting structure as well, but we started benchmarking that reporting structure. So we put together about five or six pieces of evidence that when you assessed it, holistically gave a pretty good impression of the of the how the graph was performing and probably more importantly or as importantly how well was the graph performing in comparison to the other products on the market um, and that I think is going to be an ongoing challenge for us in the device industry you know you hear about orthopedic registries now tracking graphs out to 10 15 years um, looking for joint loosening that's going to be the same I think as we go forward and I think, you know, one of the challenges for us is how do you make use of publicly available data to try and benchmark graphs and make sure these graphs are surveyed in the longer term. So that was that part of, that was my, you know, initial challenge, really. Um, but you can see that has a degree of similarities to what we do as academic surgeons and vascular interventionists. That's defining patient outcomes and seeing what works. So, so, okay, you're, you're sitting here in well, we, it's the biggest medical center in the United States. <coughs> Probably not as big as some of the Chinese ones, but, you know, one of our ex-fellows had a great idea, and that was could we pull together all the CT scans from the University of Texas, from Texas Heart, and here? Well, that's never going to happen, okay? It's a little bit like you working with, um, with Medtronic, but I mean, there's so much data yeah. that a company like yours needs. Yes. And yet you don't necessarily have access to it. I mean, if you're, you can wear the magic wand and get access to anything that we've got. What would be helpful for you? So that is the biggest challenge, I think, is how, how do you... So, so one of the biggest challenges for, that, that I think for us in medical technology and vascular intervention going forward is how do you personalize patient's treatment. So we have at the moment a large number of devices and we have disparate practices. We have interventionalists who will use the same medical device for a pathology because they're comfortable with it. You have interventionalists who try and choose a different device for a different patient. I'm not talking about aortic here, I'm talking about across the board. The, the real question for us I think is how can you buy into the huge amount of data that are available? How do you utilize technologies like artificial intelligence? And how do you fit an individual patient with an individual mm -hmm. solution? So I think it's about putting everything together. It's putting the CT scans with the device tracking with long-term Medicare output with individual treatment decisions. So how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think I you only do it through AI, right? Yeah. So obviously you have to do that as part of tracking a clinical trial. Yeah. But there's a lot of data in a place like this. Our, and <coughs> it, it's getting over this hump of patient privacy. Yeah. But with, so for example, if we could give you 10,000 CT scans 
you know, over a five, ten year period, you know, here's some for five years, here's some for ten years, here's some, and looking at aortic expansion, for example, fundamentally yeah. groundbreaking information, which exists, but it's so difficult for you to get access, for anybody to get access. Anyone to get access. And so I remember having a conversation with an engineer who came here and said, look, if I could come to Mathis Hospital and say, hey, I'm building an SFA stent, I need CAT scans from 500 patients, half of them women, half of them men, some yeah. of them Hispanic, some yeah. of them basically African American. These are the sizes. That is, it, we would pay a fortune for that because you got to go out and figure this out on an individual basis for yeah. every new product yeah. that are getting. And so what I'm kind of getting to is, how could some sort of partnership between not necessarily endologics, but you know, maybe it's the FDA that we basically partner with and give them this database that you can go and say, hey, I need, I need this. This is what I need. Can, can you get it? Instead, it's done ad hoc as best I can see, or am I wrong? No, it's not. I mean, and I mean, there's always been a commercial transaction that is available. Mm -hmm. You know, companies buy, used to buy scans in you know the old EVA days from M2S. You'd buy 900 mm. CT scans, um, but now we have the capacity that is so much more. We mm. can analyse hundreds of thousands of CT scans. I think y y your point is, how do you bring that partnership to yep. fruition? And I, I, I don't have an answer for that. The one thing I would say though is, it, it became, I think, pretty apparent to me reasonably early on in my career that we will drive clinical care forward only if clinicians and industry have a partnership. Now, it's a partnership with boundaries mm -hmm. and it's a partnership with firewalls, but there has to be a partnership because we advance clinical practice with therapeutic advances, with advances in imaging, with advances in medical devices, in technology. And that's got to be a two-way partnership where physicians give their input on design and what's needed mm -hmm. and industry responds to, to clinical needs. And that's what you're talking about there essentially mm -hmm. is how, how do you facilitate the transfer of information uh, in a form that is mutually beneficial? Mm -hmm. love, to, love to give you an answer. Yeah. Palmer? I have no answer. So I have a strategic question for you. Um, you have two aortic devices. I know the Alta device has great data as well, and um, <clears throat> they're both widely used in the U.S. How do you market two different devices from one from one industry leader? Yes, interesting, and an equally interesting question is how did we end up with two, and maybe three, <laughs> infrarenal aortic devices? But that, that may be for a for another day. No, I think you know Palmer. It goes back to what I was saying a minute ago to Alan. It, it becomes around what's a personalized choice. So, you know, without getting into any product placement or promotion, mm -hmm. AFX and Alta, are, are, they're quite differentiated from some of the other endographs that are prevalently used in the US that are, you know, predicated on self-expanding stents with proximal fixation. Um, AFX is, you know, a unibody endograft. It sits on the bifurcation, it has, slightly different structure and design um, to the proximally fixated grafts. And Alta, of course, is differentiated by not having any chronic outward force in the proximal neck, and it has adaptive ceiling. So I think you look at the design of those grafts if you're us. And if a physician doesn't want to use it as their workhorse graft, you identify a subset of patients and a subset of anatomic, physiological, and patho pathological criteria that fits with your device design. So for AFX, that's the ability to preserve the aortic bifurcation. If you want to re-intervene on PVD mm -hmm. later on, that's probably a good choice of graft. If you've got a narrow distal aorta, again, AFX is probably not a bad graft because you haven't got competing limbs in there. Uh, Alto, similarly, it's got a very broad indication, but it's the lowest profile bifurcated graft out there, so that finds utility in some patients who have small access vessels. Mm -hmm. And equally, um, there's a story that is still to be told, I think, about the proximal aortic mm -hmm. neck and mm -hmm. whether self-expanding stents cause yeah. aortic neck dilatation or aortic neck dilatation is just part of the pathology of the disease. And, you know, I think we'll understand that in due course. I mean, we are 
in a randomized trial with Alto, we're going to get some anatomic parameters when the, the follow-up accrues. And I think that'll be an interesting story to tell. But I think, I think it's about personalizing treatment. That's a kind of big theme for me as we, we go forward. And I, I really do feel that we've been in a situation probably for too long where patients just get a standard treatment that isn't necessarily as well tailored for their individual characteristics as it should be. So, I mean, you, you've got a fascinating journey, okay? You went from at the top of surgical academia to working in what some people think is the evil empire, okay? Well, I don't, sure. but, but, but I think, and, and I will tell you our Siemens story. When uh, We obviously have a big strategic relationship with Siemens, which should be incredibly valuable to us, actually. And I think that what changed was when we took a group of people, including our administration, including the people in charge of the supply chain, to Siemens. We presented science, and Siemens presented science. Mm. There's this lack of appreciation of the incredible intellectual property. By that, I mean people who work inside these companies. And, and when our administration kind of saw they saw the company, I, I believe, in a completely different light. Uh, then we took a group up to Boston Scientific, and they were fascinated by the quality controls on the supply chain. Mm. And little things like that Boston had up on the wall where if you were working basically on the, the production line and you saw a suggestion, you actually wrote it up on the wall. Okay. And at the end of the week, they summated it, and they gave a little prize to the person who had the best idea. And so I, I think that um, administrators in general their contact is when the rep comes and goes, you need to buy this, because yep. Dr. Lumsden said so. And it's like this confrontational type thing right, right off the bat. And seeing under the hood <clears throat> in some of these companies and the amazing engineers and scientists who work in them is just helps me or helps us with the, the mission of the things that we're trying to do. Yeah, great, great point. I, I mean, I can tell you just a you know, story from the past. When I first as a you know, junior attending surgeon, or probably actually as a resident, went to watch a Cook fenestrated graft being made. I, I couldn't get over the amount of quality control, the labor, the precision of the suturing that was being done to manufacture those grafts. And I think it kind of goes back to having an understanding of what medical device companies do, what medical technology companies do. I think we're uh, often behind closed doors mm -hmm. and people just see the final product. Um, I think there's a drive, um, certainly um, from me, to make uh, the company more transparent and to make people more uh, accessible for anyone who wants to have a look under the, the hood of the company. But I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think there's... Um, there's intellectual property issues, right? There's yeah. issues with firewalls and what you can share. Yeah. There's, as a public company, um, you know, what you can and can't share and what's material and what isn't. But, I mean, certainly um, I believe that we do better when we work in partnership. And I suppose that isn't a unique insight for me, but I do feel that I've got a unique journey that suggests mm -hmm. that's probably the case. I've always believed firmly that we do better if we're in partnership with our technology and industry partners as physicians than if we treat industry like the evil empire. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know requires a little bit of movement on both sides probably. Palmer, we got about another 15 minutes. What are the burning questions? So we, we, we got them in the hot seat for 15 I, minutes. <laughs> I know, I want to hear his opinion about new technologies. What is, what is your interest or what is inspiring you in different vascular beds besides the aorta? Yes, so I think that's fascinating. So there, there is a ton of really innovative work, I think, being done. I mean, the venous intervention circulation has just exploded over the last few years, hasn't it, in you know, transforming deep vein thrombosis for a therapy that patients got rat poison to now getting thrombectomies, getting their veins treated, stented. So I think... There's a, a long story to be told there. I really love the idea of deep venous arterialization for patients who've got critical ischemia. I think there's more movement in carotids and there's more technology. Um, we mentioned it earlier on, we've diversified. We've got an endovascular fempot bypass coming onto the market. 
training yeah. really excites me. Um, I think there's a long way to go there. I think we're right on the cusp of really innovative um, training portfolios, really innovative training technologies. Um, Alan knows because mm -hmm. we worked together a little bit on it, but um, during COVID, we went to a virtual reality platform for training our reps on um, our two Aortic products. Um, the ability to actually launch a product as we did with Alto in Japan and train the doctors um, from 6,000 miles away using VR headsets was extraordinary. But um, with the advances in imaging, the advances in virtual reality and artificial intelligence, I think training's probably due to undergo a, a paradigm shift uh, in due course. So, so Matt, let me, let me ask you a question. And again, <coughs> you alluded to this. Is uh, we're obviously interested in virtual reality, augmented reality. We've kind of built this thing called the Mightyverse. The idea would be it's a place you can come to and potentially train on your graph, for example. Um, it started really mainly in the orthopedic companies. Again, yeah. they're the ones that got the big, big yep. money at the moment, I guess. Yep. But I, I think you were probably the first in the cardiovascular space. I mean, there's a lot of experiences where you can go in it and see things. But I think you were the first to have a hands-on virtual reality training simulator, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, how'd you do that? I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty bold move as the new CEO. Yeah. So it, yeah. it, it was a bold move, but again, it came out of orthopedics. Um, at the time, you met Erin, um, was our director of medical education. And again, it was actually at an SVS meeting in Washington Harbor and said, come and see mm -hmm. this orthopedic virtual reality. And I went, I'm not seeing that again. I, I saw that three years ago. It's mm -hmm. terrible, it's glitchy. But, you know, went and did it, put the headset on, and again, was blown away by the evolution of the experience over a three-year time period and just thought, this is perfect for EVA. Um, now, what it's used for, I'm not sure we've fully defined yet. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think we get more traction with virtual reality from the resident group than the established attendings. The that, old, uh, old ones be, versus that, the young that, ones, that, is that, that what you're really trying that, to say? That, <laughs> that, that may, may, may be on. the case throughout, but also our reps. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, um, and again, uh, it takes around a year to 16 months to take someone who's not familiar with EVAR and get them trained on two products. And some of that time is just due to not too many cases getting done, particularly in the COVID era. Um, difficulty of scheduling cases, uh, cases moving around, different implants being used. But the ability for a rep to put on a VR headset and virtually rehearse a procedure 200 times in a mm. week, which you can do, um, is I think absolutely gold. And certainly we've seen our training time come down. I don't think it's entirely attributable to that, but that's certainly a factor within it. And it's a program that we are um, set on now, and that's the direction that we're gonna go in. So we have a virtual reality platform now for our detour peripheral procedure. Um, we have it for our two AAA products. And you know I think that is a technology that we wanna continue to invest in going forward. I think it's, it's the future. I think that technology is, you know, you know better than anyone, is going to evolve pretty quickly. Yeah, and which what I always say to people, it's as bad today as it's ever going to be, yeah. and it's just, and it's pretty darn good. And I can't even imagine what it's going to be like three, four years from now. Yeah. Now, I'm an Apple guy. Me and too. I'm very excited about the Apple Pro Vision that's going to Have you tried it? Coming. No, because I can't get my hands on it. Can you get it for us? <laughs> so, it's, I mean, I'm not here, <coughs> here to promote Apple. Actually, I'm here to promote Apple. I've, I've been a Steve Jobs fan all, all my life. And I just think that the opportunity, and we need to keep an eye on this and be involved in this. Um, as a training environment, the Oculus or Meta is fine. To be able to interact in an yep. operating room, that's yep. a whole different level by which we can bring in augmented reality. I mean, yep. virtual reality, you're in a headset, you're completely isolated. Augmented reality, you're in the room, you're in the space, I can see Matt, and I could have an aorta kind of floating here that you and I can actually interact with. And so yep. it's, it's, we're very intrigued by what you've been doing, yep. did not know that you had basically the peripheral product already yep. and that kind of built. Yep. And, and where this is going to go, 
Yeah, so I, I, I think, I mean, I think you have a better understanding mm. and, and handle on this than I do. So the, the, the virtual reality for us, it, it's rudimentary and it teaches procedural steps. Mm -hmm. So it Completely. teaches the order in which you do things and how you organize yourself during the case. What it doesn't allow you to do, which I'm sure is where you'll get, mm -hmm. is how do you rehearse mm -hmm. doing a clinical case using augmented reality or how does that mm -hmm. help you in the, in the operating room? And, and I think that's gonna come. Yeah. Um, but it's a question of how much time and how much investment that takes. Yeah, yeah. oh, I think it's gonna come. And the, the other part of this is haptic feedback. It's probably overrated in terms of you needing haptic feedback, particularly for endovascular procedures. But I mean, the, the aforementioned uh, Impella has uh, so got haptic feedback for sticking the groin, using ultrasound, and that is a remarkable leap forward. And and you know, as as more companies get engaged, so this is going to start accelerating in a way that I think is going to be very dramatic. Everybody's been dabbling; they've kind of been interested. They're afraid to be left out of it. Yeah. Is basically what it is, but. Increasingly, as you see this investment, and I think it's just going to be going nothing but accelerate this. Yeah. Palma? Mm -hmm. I have a business question for Matt. Can you comment about bankruptcy and how you inspire new investors to help transform and salvage the company? Oh, thanks for that, Palma. <laughs> <laughs> the last question. <laughs> I yeah. give Alan the easy questions. There you go. So no, I'm happy to speak about that actually, because I, I think bizarrely it's been the, the making of us. So prior to 2020, um, we were, as you know, a company that had two aortic products, another two AAA products in development. Um, pretty much all of our revenue came from elective aneurysm surgery, um, COVID hit. Elective surgery fell off the edge of a cliff, reduced by 20, 30, 40% overnight. And um, we breached uh, a lot of revenue covenants that, that we had. And so were taken into bankruptcy chapter 11. Um, and actually that period of time where we could uh, restructure our business financially, um, restructure the business in terms of our product lines, product portfolio, where we did business, which countries we were in, which countries we weren't in, um, was transformative for the company. So when we came out of the financial restructuring, uh, which is obviously a you know, lengthy legal process, um, we came out wholly owned by our so owners at the moment who are Deerfield Management, huge um, healthcare investment company, 16 billion uh, under management. Um, we had a very clear direction and it really was a, at that stage that we began um, under the stewardship of a guy called Rich Mott, who's a long-standing mm -hmm. medical device professional. He mentors me still at the moment, but we came out being able to transform the business in terms of making sure we had the right aneurysm products and weren't developing um, too many others that would compete with our existing offerings. Um, we had a remit to broaden the product portfolio because COVID told us if you put all your eggs in one basket and that basket is taken away, um, then you're in difficulties. Um, and we transformed the finances of the business um, to get ourselves through to a pathway where we can start generating a profit. Endologic's not generated a profit for many years. So actually, uh, although painful, um, and conscious that people who invested in Endologics prior to the bankruptcy um, lost their investment, including a lot of people in the company and a lot of physicians who believed in the products. Um, it was a transformative process in being able to set the business on a clear course to become a big player in the interventional vascular space. And our plan on doing that is to make sure the AAA business is stable, make sure we have good products back with good clinical evidence that are performing well, um, launch some peripheral products. So the detour procedure um, has FDA breakthrough device designation. We got approval in June. We're just in a very limited market release at the moment. And we've organized the business to be the right size for our revenue and push us on a path to profitability. And in terms of what investors are looking for, um, Palmer, I mean, that's, 
that's changed since 2020. Um, there's been no really medical device IPOs for three years. Mm. It's been a pretty unprecedented time um, for companies going public. But in order to attract investment, we've got to be a company with a good culture, um, which we've put a lot of effort into becoming more responsive, more transparent. We've got to have a clear purpose, which I think we do within the interventional vascular space. We have to grow our revenues. Um, all investors want to see that you're growing your revenue. And we've got to be structured so that we're attractive for investment. So pathway to profitability and a capital structure that is attractive for an IPO. And that, that bankruptcy allowed us to do that. So it was a painful period, but um, we needed a reset as a business. And I think we've come out of the other end um, stronger. We come out the other end with a physician as a CEO, which I think is a good, good, yeah, yeah. A, a so good direction as well for me. So we probably need to start winding up. Let me make a couple of plugs actually for uh, for Methodist, and that is that um, about a month and a half ago, because you talked about culture, um, <coughs> in a national survey of large employees, which were the employers defined as greater than ten thousand, this institution was ranked number two in the country mm. as judged by their employees. And number one was MIT, number okay. two was Houston Mathis. Mm. And so I, I, these are things that we often don't think about sharing, is how does our administration done a remarkable job of building the sense of Methodist? Yeah. Um, after, it wasn't bankruptcy, but it was a pretty significant divorce that took place between <laughs> Baylor College of Medicine and us. And so it was kind of organization that was kind of blown apart. And how do you build that culture, which I think you've done, to build this back into something that it was? And, you know, we've all heard a whole bunch of presentations. And for the majority of people who go up to give a presentation, you know, it goes in one ear and it goes out the other and they have no credibility. You'll never like that. I mean, you, you, all, you know what it's like. You go and go, Listen to this person, because they're going to tell you like it is. And I think that, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke for you here, um, is that you always had that presence for me when you're on a podium. And I really think you've brought that over into you know, the commercial world, is that you're transparent, you tell it, tell the problems, and tell it. And that's, I think, is an amazing accomplishment that you kind of brought over into the medical device world, not just, not just end of logic. So thank you really for doing that. Um, maybe Thank one other plug, and then I'm going to give it back Thank to you. Thank you. Sorry. No, you're welcome. Is that one of the things you'd be interested in is we started a new medical school here, okay? We're now just graduated our first class, yeah. and we're very proud of it, and we've kind of built all this stuff. But then somebody came up with that. We're going to start a new medical school. Like, oh, my gosh, what next? And it's called NMED, Engineering and Medicine. Nice. It's a joint venture with Texas A&M. You can't get in this unless you're an innovation-focused engineer. And, it's, and one of the problems we have in Houston is we don't have enough startups. So we've kind of, you know, there's the Northeast, there's the Bay Area, and there's us in the Gulf Coast. And you given the scale of what's going on here, the our focus of, you know, medical center here and the city is around innovation and building medical device startups. Mm. And by bringing these engineers and they all train here at Methodist, we want people like you to be looking for them to be part of your company and potentially involved in startups. Sounds an it's amazing a, opportunity. It is. Palma, close it out. Well, I just want to thank Matt. I think uh, I loved all your answers. I learned so much, and I can't watch your rewatch the show. I know that there's many people that uh, maybe they couldn't join this live, but they'll be watching this later. And I really appreciate all your time. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. Thank you, Palma. Appreciate you coming Thanks, and doing Al. this. Thank you. Good night. Good night, guys.